This is section 38 of Newspaper Articles by Mark Twain. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Newspaper Articles by Mark Twain. The San Francisco Daily Morning Call, August 1864, Part 2. The San Francisco Daily Morning Call, August 12, 1864. What a Skyrocket Did. Night before last, a stick six or seven feet long, attached to an exploded rocket of large size, came crashing down through the zinc roof of a tenement in Milton Place, Bush Street, between Dupont and Kearney, passed through a cloth ceiling, and fetched up on the floor alongside a gentleman's bed, with a smash like the disruption of a china shop. We have been told by a person with whom we are not acquainted, and of whose reliability we have now no opportunity of satisfying ourselves, as he has gone to his residence, which is situated on the San Jose Road at some distance from the city, that when the rocket tore up the splinters around the bed, the gentleman got up. The person also said that he went out, adding, after some deliberation, and with the air of a man who has made up his mind that what he is about to say can be substantiated if necessary, that he went out quick. This person also said that after the gentleman went out quick, he ran, and then, with a great show of disinterestedness, he ventured upon the conjecture that he was running yet. He hastened to modify this rash conjecture, however, by observing that he had no particular reason for suspecting that the gentleman was running yet. It was only a notion of his, and just flashed on him, like. He then hitched up his team, which he observed parenthetically that he wished they belonged to him, but they didn't and immediately drove away in the direction of his country seat. The tenement is there yet, though, with the hole through the zinc roof. The tenement is the property of ex-supervisor Hinckley, and some of the best educated men in the city consider that the hole is also, because it is on his premises. It is a very good hole. If it could be taken from the roof just in the shape it is now, it would be a nice thing to show at the mechanics' fair. Any man who would make a pun under circumstances like these, and suggest that it be turned over to the Christian Commission Fair on account of its holy nature, might think himself smart, but would the people, the plodding, thinking, intelligent masses, would these respect him? Far be it! Doubtless! What shadows we are, and what shadows we pursue! The foregoing facts are written to prepare the reader for the announcement that the stick, with the same exploded rocket attached, may be seen at the hall of the Board of Supervisors. It has remained there to this day. The man who set it off, and hung on to it, and went up with it, has not come down yet. The people who live in Milton Place are expecting him all the time. They have moved their families, and got out of the way so as to give him a good show when he drops. They have said, but without insisting on it, that if it would be all the same to him, they would rather he fall in the alley. This would mash him up a good deal, likely, and scatter him around some, but they think they could scrape him up and hold an inquest on him, and inform his parents. The Board of Supervisors will probably pass an ordinance directing that missiles of the dangerous nature of rockets shall henceforth be fired in the direction of the bay, so as to guard against accidents to life and property. The San Francisco Daily Morning Call, August 13, 1864. Sundries. A pile of miscellaneous articles was found heaped up at a late hour last night away down somewhere in Harrison Street which attracted the notice of numbers of passers-by, and divers attempts were made to analyze the same without effect, for the reason that no one could tell where to begin, or which was on top. Two special policemen dropped in just then and solved the difficulty, showing a clean inventory of one horse, one buggy, two men, and an indefinite amount of liquor. The liquor couldn't be got at to be gauged, consequently the proof of it couldn't be told. 
The men, though, were good proof that the liquor was there, for they were as drunk as Bacchus and his brother. A fight had been on hand somewhere, and one of the men had been close to it, for his face was painted up in various hues, sky-blue and crimson being prominent. The order of the buggy was inverted, and the horse beyond a realizing sense of his condition. The men went with some noise to the station-house, and the animal, with attachments being set to rights, ambled off to a livery stable on Kearney Street. The San Francisco Daily Morning Call, August 13, 1864 Won't you walk into my parlor? A whole bevy of those funny-looking animals that totter through the street labeled Chinese women had been invited to call upon Judge Shepard yesterday morning, when they would hear something to their disadvantage. These Tai Pings were charged with tappings, and as they didn't appear, the judge charged them for it, and much bail was forfeited. There were about a dozen cases. The offense is simply a conventional sign of invitation to persons passing to walk in, and grows out of the characteristic hospitality of that class of persons. The San Francisco Daily Morning Call, August 16, 1864 an ill-advised prosecution. Yesterday morning Rufus Temple was examined before Judge Shepard on a charge of obtaining money under false pretenses, and acquitted. We are disposed to make a specific and more extended reference to this matter than its importance would seem to demand from the fact that Mr. Temple is said to be an honest, industrious young man who has been placed in an unfavorable light before the public by being arraigned in a court of justice on a criminal charge. The testimony, which signally failed to sustain the charge, went simply to show that the defendant, who follows the trade of a caulker, had been employed by Mr. Vice, the prosecuting witness, to do some extra work on the steamer Nina Tilden, that Temple presented a bill of thirty dollars to Mr. V. for his work, which was for some reason refused, upon which the bill was presented to Mr. Tilden, the owner or one of the owners of the vessel, who remarked, in substance, that he was not the proper person to pay such bills, but, as he did not wish any claims to stand against the vessel, he would pay it, which he did, taking Mr. Temple's receipt therefore. Upon learning the fact of the payment, Mr. Vice saw the city prosecutor, and a verified complaint was made, embodying the averment that Temple had represented to Mr. Tilden that he was sent to him, Tilden, with a verbal order from an affiant for the payment of the bill. Mr. Tilden, who was a witness for the prosecution, denied, on his oath, that Temple had made any such representation, and that fact being the gist of the offense, the prosecution was at once abandoned. We cannot but speak in terms of the strongest condemnation of the reprehensible manner in which parties very frequently come into the police court under the sanction of the prosecuting attorney. With all of perjury except the technical animus, they seek to wield this tribunal as a mollifier of their personal feelings, as if it were instituted as a general dispenser of the lex talionis. It is indeed a fortunate thing for the community that we have just such a man as Judge Shepard on the bench, where discrimination and decision are so much required. The San Francisco Daily Morning Call, August 17, 1864 School Director Pope and the Call At the meeting of the Board of Education last evening, Mr. Pope complained that he had been misrepresented by the reporter for the call, as well as by the secretary of the board in his minutes, in the statements of his resolution introduced at the last meeting, on the subject of the participation by the pupils of the different schools in the exercises of the Freedman's Concert. Mr. Pope says that his resolution was not to require the grammar class, that had declined to participate on that occasion, to do so against their will, but to inform the members of that class that if they did so decline, they would be required to continue their usual daily exercises in school. If this was Mr. Pope's statement, he may have the benefit of it, though the fact that both the reporter and the secretary of the board 
who are both presumed to be, and really are close listeners to the proceedings of the body, should understand the director exactly alike, and fall into the same identical error, is, to say the least, a very extraordinary coincidence. Whatever may have been the exact phraseology of the gentleman's motion, the evident intention of the measure and the disposition of more than one member of the board was certainly expressed in our report and the secretary's minutes however as we entertain no feelings of hostility toward any member of the board we in our own individual repertorial capacity will concede retract or admit anything in the world for the sake of the argument and to keep peace in the family but understand we don't mean it all nor near it the san francisco daily morning call august sixteenth eighteen sixty four man run over a man fell off his own dray or rather it was a large truck wagon in davis street yesterday and the four wheels passed over his body a bystander stopped the horses and they backed the same wheels over the man's body a second time after which he crawled out jumped on the wagon, muttered something about being tired of such damned foolishness, and drove off before a surgeon could arrive to amputate him. The San Francisco Daily Morning Call, August 18, 1864. Daring attempt to assassinate a pawnbroker in broad daylight. The wounds probably fatal. Eight thousand dollars worth of diamonds and watches stolen. Yesterday afternoon, about half-past two o'clock, a pawnbroker named Meyer, whose establishment is in Commercial Street, below Kearney, went out and left his son Henry, a youth of eighteen or twenty perhaps, to attend to the business during his absence. Upon returning, half an hour later, he found pools of blood here and there, a knife, and double-barreled shotgun on the floor. The latter weapon parted from its stock. Several trays of watches, diamonds, and various kinds of jewelry gone, the doors of the safe open, its drawers pulled out and despoiled of their contents. Disorder visible everywhere, but his son nowhere to be seen. Hearing a faint groan, he ran into the back room, and there in the gloom he discerned his boy, lying on the floor and weltering in blood. Now, after reading the above, the public will know exactly as much about this ghastly mystery as the police know, as anybody knows, except the murderer himself. So far as heard from, nobody was seen to enter the store during Mr. Meyer's absence, and nobody was seen to leave. The assassin did his work between half-past two and three o'clock in the afternoon, in the busiest portion of one of the busiest thoroughfares of the city, and departed unseen and left no sign by which his identity may hereafter be established. Up to the present writing, the boy has only groaned in pain and is speechless. We reached the spot a few minutes after the tragedy was discovered, and found the street in front blockaded by a crowd of men staring at the premises in blank fascination, and entering, found another crowd composed of policemen, doctors, detectives, and reporters, engaged as such people are usually engaged upon such occasions. The boy's body and his bunk were deluged in blood, and efforts were being made to relieve his sufferings. There was apparently but one wound upon him, and that had been inflicted on the back of his head behind his right ear. The skull was indented as if by a slung shot. Probably neither the knife nor the gun found upon the floor were used in the assault. Near one of the windows in the front office, closely curtained against observation from the street, was a pool of gouted blood, as large as a chair-seat, and the blow was given there, no doubt, for from that spot a roadway was marked in the dust of the floor to the extreme end of the back room where the body was found, showing that after he was knocked senseless the robbers must have dragged him to that spot to guard against his attracting attention by making an outcry. Mr. Meyer says the valuables carried off by the daring perpetrators of the outrage are worth about eight thousand dollars. A man came in while we were present, and told Captain Lees that about the time he saw the crowd running toward Commercial Street, he met a man in Kearney Street, running as if destruction were at his heels. 
that he broke frantically through a blockade of wagons, carriages, and a funeral procession, sped on his way, and was out of sight in a moment, that he was thick-set, about five feet seven or eight inches in stature, wore dark clothing, a black slouch hat, and had a sort of narrow goatee, that he had improvised a sack out of an old calico dress, the neck of which sack he grasped in his hand, and had the surplus calico wrapped round his arm. The appearance of the said sack was as if it might have a hat full of eggs in it, two dozen or thereabouts, you might say. Five minutes after the conclusion of the narrative, we observed the man who saw all this speeding up town in a buggy with a detective. At the chief's office, fifteen minutes after the discovery of the bloody catastrophe, Mr. Burke's campaign commenced, and he was dictating orders to a small army of policemen with a decision and rapidity commensurate with the urgency of the occasion. You, and you, and you, go to the Stockton and Sacramento boats, and arrest every Chinaman and every suspicious white man that tries to go on board. You and you, go to the San Jose Railroad, same order. You, go to the stable and order two fleet horses to be saddled and sent here instantly. You, and you, and you, go to the heads of the Chinese companies, and tell them to detain every suspicious Chinaman they see, and send me word. I'll be responsible." And so on and so forth, until squads of policemen were scattering abroad through every portion of the city, and closing every prominent avenue of escape from it. An affair like this makes hurrying times in the police department. After all, the wonder is that an enterprise like this robbery and attempted assassination has not previously been essayed in Mr. Myers and other pawnbroking establishments. They are not frequented by customers in the daytime, and the glass doors and windows are rendered untransparent by thick coats of paint, and also by curtains that are always closed, so that nothing that transpires within can be seen from the street. One or two active men could enter such a place at night, gag the occupants, turn the gas nearly out, and take their own time about robbing the concern, for customers would not be apt to molest an establishment through whose shaded windows no light appeared. Up to eleven o'clock last night young Meyer was still irrational, although he had spoken incoherently several times of matters foreign to the misfortune that had befallen him. We have this from Dr. Murphy, his physician, who saw him at that hour. The doctor says the wound was evidently inflicted with a slung-shot. Its form is an egg-shaped indentation at the base of the brain. There are also the distinct marks of four fingers and a thumb on the throat, made by the left hand of the man who assaulted him. Whose left hand among ye will fit those marks? The patient can only swallow with great difficulty, on account of the fearful choking he received, and the consequent swelling and soreness of the glands of the throat. He suffers chiefly, however, from the pressing of the indented skull upon the brain. His condition improves a little all the time, and although the chances are nearly all against his recovery, still that result is regarded as comfortably within the margin of possibility. Unless he comes to his senses, it will be next to impossible ever to establish the guilt of any man suspected of this crime. An ordinary deed of blood excites only a passing interest in San Francisco, but to show how much a little mystery enhances the importance of such an occurrence, we will mention that at no time, from three o'clock in the afternoon yesterday until midnight, was there a moment when there was not a crowd in front of Meyer's store, gazing at its darkened windows and closed and guarded doors. During the afternoon and night several white men were arrested about town on suspicion, and seventy-two Chinamen were detained from leaving on the boats until after the hour for sailing. The right man is doubtless at large yet, however. The San Francisco Daily Morning Call, August 19, 1864 The New Chinese Temple Today the Ning Yong Company will finish furnishing and decorating the new Josh House, or place of worship, built by them in Broadway, between Dupont and Kearney Streets, and tomorrow they will begin their unchristian devotions in it. The building is a handsome brick edifice two stories high on Broadway, and three on the alley in the rear. Both fronts are of pressed brick. 
a small army of workmen were busily engaged yesterday in putting on the finishing touches of the embellishments. The throne of the immortal Josh is at the head of the hall in the third story, within a sort of alcove of elaborately carved and gilded woodwork, representing human figures and birds and beasts of all degrees of hideousness. Josh himself is as ugly a monster as can be found outside of China. He is in a sitting posture is about middle stature, but excessively fat. His garments are flowing and ample, garnished with a few small circlets of looking-glass to represent jewels, and streaked and striped, daubed from head to foot with paints of the liveliest colors. A long strand of black horsehair sprouts from each corner of his upper lip, another from the center of his chin, and one from just forward of each ear. He wears an open-work crown, which gleams with gold leaf. His rotund face is painted a glaring red, and the general expression of this fat and happy god is as if he had eaten too much rice and rats for dinner, and would like his belt loosened if he only had the energy to do it. In front of the throne hangs a chandelier of Chinese manufacture, with a wilderness of glass drops and curved candle supports about it but it is not as elegant and graceful as the American article. Under it, in a heavy framework, a big church bell is hung, also of Chinese workmanship. It is carved and daubed with many-colored paint all over. In front of the bell three long tables are arranged, the fronts of two of which display a perfect maze-work of carving. The principal one shows, behind a glass front, several hundred splendidly gilded figures of kings on thrones, and bowing and smirking attendants, and horses on the rampage. The figures in this huge carved picture stand out in bold relief from background, but they are not stuck on. The whole concern is worked out of a single broad slab of timber, and only the cunning hand of a Chinaman could have wrought it. Over the forward table is suspended a sort of shield, of indescribable shape, whose face is marked in compartments like a coat of arms, and in each of these is another nightmare of burnished and distorted human figures. The ceiling of this room, and both sides of it, are adorned with great signboards. They look like that to a content Christian, at any rate, bearing immense Chinese letters or characters, sometimes raised from the surface of the wood and sometimes cut into it, and sometimes these letters being painted a bright red or green, and the grand expanse of signboard blazing with gold leaf, or vice versa. These signs are presents to the church from other companies, and they bear the names of those corporations, and possibly some extravagant Chinese moral or other, though if the latter was the case we failed to prove it by Ah Wei, our urbane and intelligent interpreter. Up and down the room, on both sides, are ranged alternate chairs and tables, made of the same hard, close-grained black wood used in the carved tables above mentioned. Devout pagans lean their elbows on these little side tables, and swill tea while they worship Josh. Now, humble and unpretending Christian as we are, there was something infinitely comfortable and touching to us in this gentle mingling together of piety and breakfast. They have a large painted drum, and a pig or two, in this temple. How would it strike you now to stand at one end of this room with ranks of repentant Chinamen extending down either side before you, sipping purifying tea, and all about and above them a gorgeous cloud of glaring colors, and dazzling gold and tinsel, with the bell tolling, and the drums thundering, and the gongs clanging, and portly, blushing old Josh in the distance, smiling upon it all, in his imbecile way, from out his splendid canopy. Nice, perhaps? In the second story there are more painted emblems and symbols than we could describe in a week. In the first story are six long white slats, in a sort of vault, split into one hundred and fifty divisions, each like the keys of a piano and this affair is the death register of the Ningyong Company. When a man dies, his name, age, his native place in China, and the place of his death in this country are inscribed on one of these keys, and the record is always preserved. Ah Wei 
tells us that the ning yong company numbers eighteen or twenty thousand persons on this coast now and has numbered as high as twenty eight thousand ah wei speaks good english and is the outside business man of the tribe that is he transacts matters with us barbarians he will occupy rooms and offices in the temple as will also the great wai ga the ineffable high priest of the temple and sing song or president of the ning yong company the names of the temple inscribed over its doors are ning yong chu o and ning yong wai kuang both mean the same thing but one is more refined and elegant and is suited to a higher and more cultivated class of chinese than the other though to our notion they appear pretty much the same thing as far as facility of comprehending them is concerned to-morrow the temple will be opened and all save chinese will be excluded from it until about the fifth of september when white folks will be free to visit it due notice having first been given in the newspapers and a general invitation extended to the public the san francisco daily morning call august nineteenth eighteen sixty four what goes with the money since the recent extraordinary expose of the concerns of the grass silver mining valley company by which stockholders discovered to their grief and dismay that figures could lie as to what became of some of their assessments and could also be ominously reticent as to what went with the balance people have begun to discuss the possibility of inventing a plan by which they may be advised from time to time of the manner in which their money is being expended by officers of mining companies to the end that they may seasonably check any tendency towards undue extravagance or dishonest expenditures that may manifest itself instead of being compelled to wait a year or two in ignorance and suspense to find at last that they have been bankrupt to no purpose and it is time their creative talents were at work in this direction the longer they sleep the dread sleep of the grass valley the more terrible will be the awakening from it money is being squandered with a recklessness that knows no limit that had a beginning but seemingly hath no end save a beggarly minority of dividend-paying companies and after these years of expectation and this waste of capital what account of stewardship has been rendered unto the flayed stockholder what does he know about the disposition that has been made of his money what brighter promise has he now than in any bygone time that he is not to go on hopelessly paying assessments and wondering what becomes of them until gabriel sounds his trumpet the hale and norcross officers decide to sink a shaft they levy forty thousand dollars next month they have a mighty good notion to go lower and they levy a twenty thousand dollar assessment next month the novelty of sinking the shaft has about worn off and they think it would be nice to drift a while twenty thousand dollars the following month it occurs to them it would be so funny to pump a little and they buy a forty thousand dollar pump thus it goes on for months and months but the hale and norcross sends us no bullion though most of the time there is an encouraging rumor afloat that they are right in the casing take the choler company for instance it seems easy on its children just now but who does not remember its regular old monotonous assessment anthem sixty dollars a foot sixty dollars a foot sixty dollars a foot month in and month out till the persecuted stockholder howled again the same way with the best and belcher and the same way with three-fourths of the mines on the main lead from cedar hill to silver city we could scarcely name them all in a single article but we have given a specimen or so by which the balance may be measured and what has gone with the money we pause a year or two for a reply now in some of the states all banks are compelled to publish a monthly statement of their affairs why not make the big mining companies do the same thing it would make some of them fearfully sick at first but they would feel all the better for it in the long run the legislature is not in session and a law to this effect cannot now be passed but if one company dare voluntarily to set the example the balance would follow by pressure of circumstances 
but that first bold company does not exist, perhaps. If it does, a grateful community will be glad to hear from it. Where is it? Let it come forward and offer itself as the sacrificial scapegoat to bear the sins of its fellows into the wilderness. The San Francisco Daily Morning Call, August 20, 1864 Mary Kane this accomplished old gin-barrel came out of the county jail early in the morning three days ago, and was promptly in the station-house, drunk as a loon, before the middle of the day. She got out the next day, but was in again before night. She got out the following morning, but yesterday noon she was back again, with her noble heart preserved in spirits as usual. Having a full cargo aboard by this time, she will probably clear for her native land in the county jail to-day. The San Francisco Daily Morning Call, August 20, 1864 More Abuse of Sailors Yesterday afternoon a commission was engaged in the United States District Courtroom, taking testimony in the criminal proceedings instituted against Luther Hopkins, master of the American ship Carlisle, for brutally treating Andrew Anderson, one of the ship's crew. The affidavit of the prosecuting witness states that on the 2nd April, 1864, Captain Hopkins cruelly beat him with a belaying pin while he was sick, inflicting serious injuries on him. And also on the 27th April, Anderson being still sick, Hopkins, the defendant, beat him on the head with a belaying pin. And again on the 27th June, still being an invalid, he was beaten with a heavy knotted rope more than twenty blows by the captain of the vessel, who also caused him to be bitten by a dog. Poor Jack seeks redress and protection in the United States court. When the captain marshals his subordinates, from first officer down to forty-ninth cook, all dependent on him for the tenure of their dignities, they will with one voice swear they never saw the captain do any such thing, blind as bats, while the poor victim felt it sensibly, and his quaking comrades in the forecastle saw it distinctly enough. It would be a hard thing should a captain be punished for merely killing a sailor or two as a matter of pastime. The San Francisco Daily Morning Call, August 21, 1864 The Chinese Temple The new Chinese temple in Broadway, the Ningyong Wei Kuang of the Ningyong Company, was dedicated to the mighty Josh night before last, with a general looseness in the way of beating of drums, clanging of gongs, and burning of yellow paper, commensurate with the high importance of the occasion. In the presence of the great idol, the other day, our cultivated friend, Ah Wei, informed us that the old original Josh, of whom the image was only an imitation, a substitute vested with power to act for the absent god, and bless Chinamen, or damn them, according to the best of his judgment, lived in ancient times on the mountain of Wong Chu, was seventeen feet high, and wielded a club that weighed two tons, that he died two thousand five hundred years ago, but that he is all right yet in the celestial kingdom, and can come on earth, or appear anywhere he pleases, at a moment's notice, and that he could come down here and cave our head in with his club if he wanted to. We hope he don't want to. Ah Wei told us all that, and we deliver it to the public just as we got it, advising all to receive it with caution, and not bet on its truthfulness until after mature reflection and deliberation. As far as we are concerned, we don't believe it, for all it sounds so plausible. The San Francisco Daily Morning Call, August 21, 1864 it is the Daniel Webster, Mining Company's Accounts. The morning call of yesterday has a lively article on mining companies suggesting that mining trustees should publish quarterly statements of expenditures and receipts, concluding with, The legislature is not in session, and a law to this effect cannot now be passed. But if one company dare voluntarily to set the example, the balance would follow by pressure of circumstances but that first bold company does not exist, perhaps. If it does, a grateful community will be glad to hear from it. Where is it? Let it come forward and offer itself as the sacrificial scapegoat to bear the sins of its fellows in the wilderness. 
in answer to this the officers of the daniel webster mining company located in devil's gate district nevada territory have requested us to inform the shareholders and others who have purchased stock in this company at high prices that a complete exhibit of the company's affairs will be made public in the argus on saturday next this company in consequence of a couple of shareholders in nevada territory legal gentlemen at that paying their previous assessments in greenbacks has been the first to levy an assessment payable in currency we believe however they will be the first who dare to make public their accounts we hope the coso will be the next to follow suit as a correspondent of ours in sacramento whose letter appears under the appropriate heading seems anxious to learn what has become of the forty three thousand two hundred dollars collected by this company for assessments the last year s f argus saturday so there are company officers who are bold enough fair enough true enough to the interests entrusted to their keeping to let stockholders as well as all who may chance to become so know the character of their stewardship and whose records are white enough to bear inspection we had not believed it and we are glad that a mining company worthy of the name of daniel webster existed to save to us the remnant of our faith in the uprightness of these dumb and inscrutable institutions we have nothing to fear now all that was wanting was some one to take the lead other companies will see that this monthly or quarterly exhibit of their affairs is nothing but a simple act of justice to their stockholders and to others who may desire to become so they will also see that it is policy to let the public know where invested money will be judiciously used and strictly accounted for and our word for it companies that dare to show their books will soon fall into line and adopt the system of published periodical statements in time it will become a custom and custom is more binding more impregnable and more exacting than any law that was ever framed in that day the coso will be heard from and so will companies in virginia which sport vast and gorgeously painted shaft and machinery houses with costly and beautiful green chicken cocks on the roof which are able to tell how the wind blows yet are savagely ignorant concerning dividends so will other companies come out and say what it costs to build their duck ponds so will still others tell their stockholders why they paid sixty thousand dollars for machinery worth about half the money another that we have in our eye will show what they did with an expensive lot of timbers when they haven't got enough in their mind to shingle a chicken coop with and yet others will let us know if they are still in the casing and why they levy a forty thousand dollar assessment every six weeks to run a drift with secretaries superintendents and boards of trustees that don't like the prospect had better resign the public have got precious little confidence in the present lot and the public will back this assertion we are making in its name stockholders are very tired of being at the mercy of omnipotent and invisible officers and are ripe for the inauguration of a safer and more sensible state of things and when it is inaugurated mining property will thrive again and not before confidence is the mainstay of every class of commercial enterprise the san francisco daily morning call august twenty third eighteen sixty four no earthquake in consequence of the warm close atmosphere which smothered the city at two o'clock yesterday afternoon everybody expected to be shaken out of their boots by an earthquake before night but up to the hour of our going to press the supernatural boot-jack had not arrived yet that is just what makes it so unhealthy the earthquakes are getting so irregular when a community get used to a thing they suffer when they have to go without it however the trouble cannot be remedied we know of nothing that will answer as a substitute for one of those convulsions to an unmarried man the san francisco daily morning call august twenty third eighteen sixty four rain one of those singular freaks of nature which by reference to the dictionary we find described as the water or the descent of water that falls in drops from the clouds shower occurred here yesterday 
and kept the community in a state of pleasant astonishment for the space of several hours. They would not have been astonished at an earthquake, though. Thus it will be observed that nothing accustoms one to a thing so readily as getting used to it. You will always notice that in America. We were thinking this refreshing rain would make everybody happy. Not so the cows. An agricultural sharp informs us that yesterday's rain was a misfortune to California, that it will kill the dry grass upon which the cattle now subsist, and also the young grass upon which they were calculating to subsist hereafter. We know nothing whatever about the matter, but we do know that if what this gentleman says is strictly true, the inevitable deduction is that the cattle are out of luck. We stand to that. End of section 38